As I was just saying, we have a conversation for the nerds of citizens' assemblies today, specifically climate assemblies. I'm one of them. My name is Mark Beanland, and I work for the Danish Board of Technology, which is the organization that is what we call the convener of the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies. And I'm fairly new to this role, but not entirely new to this type of work. Um, but today, my job is to be your host and to guide you through what is going to hopefully be a very interesting conversation. Um, we have some really good people with us. I'll get back to explaining who they are and what's going to happen in a second. But before we get started with anything else, I want to pass the floor to my very good colleague and the chair of Knocker, who can just give a much clearer and much more concise explanation to what Knocker really is than I would be able to do. So, Graham, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Mark, and hello, everybody. Uh, it's, it's been a it's been a while since we've. Uh, We've we've had a call, so this this is great. It's great to see people. Um, just I think most of the people on this call know, but just in case you're not aware, the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies is funded by the European Climate Foundation. We have um, four main aims, which are to uh, understand what's going on in the world at the moment of climate assemblies, to create good practice for impact, to um, to actually try and shape the future of climate assemblies, and to do this through a process of co-creation with other members of the network. Um, most of you will know that we, we're kind of famous for our learning calls where we've been looking at particular um, climate assemblies, but we, uh, which in many ways fulfills our first ambition of trying to understand what's out there, but also started to raise issues of good practice. And I think in the next few months, what we really want to do is to dive in, in on particular aspects of climate assembly practice. That won't mean we give up on learning calls. We're going to do a learning call in Austria on Spain and Luxembourg in the next in the next few months. But we really want to jump into some of the really nitty issue, the, the, the knotty, nitty issues, the knotty issues of, um, of climate assemblies. And the one that we've chosen to look at today is on governance. I'd like to thank everybody who's uh, put this uh, event together and I will hand you back to Mark. And I'm really looking forward to participating with you in, in trying to understand the pros and cons of different ways of thinking about governance and whether or not we can come up with some guidance to those people who are taking this first step in trying to organize an assembly. So once again, thank you very much and over to you, Mark. Thank you, Graham. And that's my cue for trying to share my screen now. Hopefully, if this goes well, you will see me sharing a PowerPoint presentation. Now, there, it's, a, it's what I might call the shortest PowerPoint presentation ever. Uh, it's really just a few slides, but it's to make sure that you have a good sense of what we're about to do. So we're going to try to keep you here until about 5.30. Um, with a bit of luck, we'll get much wiser in the time ahead of us on how you can govern a climate assembly. And we'll do so with some really, uh, really experienced people who've been on this first wave of working with climate assemblies. Now, we will invite all of you to be a part of this conversation. So you can warm up your um, warm up your own thoughts on what you might have to contribute. Because as we go through this, it'll go from one way communication and become more and more uh, a gradual gradually become more and more of a conversation among all of us. Um, the first point will be introducing Jane Carrick, who has done a bit of a study on which governance models has been used in the first series of climate assemblies. So. Jane will talk us through some of her findings. That'll lead us into a panel discussion where we have, we're very lucky to have someone from four specific national climate assemblies present with us today. So I'll introduce who they are, but I can already now say that we have people from the Danish Climate Assembly, uh, the UK Climate Assembly, Scottish Climate Assembly, and uh, the French Climate Assembly. So we have some quite interesting perspectives that we're gonna dig into. And it's the idea that when we've had a panel discussion with them, we open up the discussion for all of us. And I know that in this room, there is a lot of people with a lot of experience. So please do feel very invited to be a part of this conversation as we go along. Now, before anything else, I want to introduce Jane. And Jane, you have been working over a period of time on what is one of our I'm going to stop at the sharing screen. Huh? Um, you've been working on one of these projects that Graham was just referencing, where we dare to dig a little deeper. And over this past uh, bit more than a year, you've been looking at 
how climate assemblies has governed. So would you take the floor and share your screen and tell us a little bit about who you are and how you conducted this research and more specifically what you found, found out. The floor is yours when you're ready. Yeah, that, thanks, Mark. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to start by sharing my screen. Bear with me. OK, um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jane Carrick, as uh, Mark um, introduced me. Um, I've been working with Kanoka for nearly a year now, but this is sort of nearly the end of my time with the group. So and it's the last kind of big task that I've got to do. So it's really nice to share that with you all. Um, as Mark said, I've been doing a review of the governance around um, climate assemblies, the first eight cli national climate assemblies, and I'm sharing that with you today. Um, hopefully you see the second slide. Um, so um, we started this review from a position that the legitimacy of mini publics partly depend on stakeholders and the public having confidence and trust in how decisions are made about their design and implementation. But we found that there's been little research on how the governance has actually been set up around climate assembly specifically. Um, to tackle this, we've reviewed the eight, eight of the first national climate assemblies to identify the different ways governance has been structured to date and the pros and cons of the different approaches. Um, we completed a desk review of each assembly and interviewed one key informant from each. These key informants represented a range of perspectives, um, including a chair, secretariat, um, a uh, somebody, people from delivery organisations and commissioners, etc. However, the, we do recognise that, that there's a limitation, uh, the limitation in, in interviewing one key informant from each assembly. The review um, revealed that there have been broadly three approaches to structuring governance for national climate assemblies. The first is that external practitioners or delivery organizations were appointed to deliver, um, to design and deliver the assembly. The second type was that a, um, a secretariat was appointed that comprised a seconded civil servants. And the third type was that a multi-stakeholder group was appointed to um, take the lead on governance. We did, however, find that in practice, decision making worked differently within these three structures, depending on how much and when the commissioners relinquished power to the body they appointed to deliver the process. I will now describe these three approaches and describe the variations within the approach uh, within the types with a brief description of the eight assemblies. I'll start with those assemblies that appointed external practitioners. Decision-making varied within this category, as I say, depending on the extent the commissioners retained control. For Climate Assembly UK, the commissioners um, retained an active control in decision-making during the process. The second um, approach within this type was that commissioners in the Danish and the German um, climate assemblies took a more supervisory role by a scheduled regular meetings. In the Finnish um, citizens jury on climate action and, Jer and Jersey's citizens assembly on climate change, the commissioners were more hands off, providing ad hoc advice throughout the process upon request. The next few slides show diagrams of the governance structures. This, this is partly to avoid you being overwhelmed by text-based slides. However, I recognize these diagrams do appear complex. They serve to illustrate the relative, um, I think that they do serve to um, illustrate the relative complexity of governance between this, the assemblies. Please don't try and read everything, but it's useful for you to know that the nodes represent roles or organisations and the arrows represent direction of action. Um, I've coloured um, items red that represent management roles or actions. Blue, thing, uh, blue arrows and nodes um, represent operational um, uh, actions. Green support roles and actions and yellow 
represents reviewing and monitoring. So in terms of governance, the red nodes and arrows indicate when, where decision-making responsibility sat. So for CA UK, sorry, Climate Assembly UK, you can see that decision-making was concentrated with two organisations, the external delivery organisation involved and the commissioners, the six parliamentary select committees. The, the commissioners um, of Climate Assembly UK remained actively involved in the decision-making through the process by your parliamentary officials. We found that decision-making was iterative Parliamentary officials provided a specification to involve, which then developed the proposals, which in turn were checked by the parliamentary officials, who then could request changes and so on. The process was supported by four expert leads, an advisory group of stakeholders and an academic group of climate change experts. The delivery organisation and expert leads worked collaboratively to make day-to-day -day decisions during the assembly's operation. The, um, the Danish Climate Assembly, in contrast, was commissioned by the Ministry of Climate, Energy and Supply, who supervised the design and implementation of the assembly during regular meetings of what they called a planning group. This planning group um, comprised a representative from the Danish Board of Technology, who won the procurement to design and run the Climate Assembly, a lead civil servant from the Ministry, and five Assembly members. DBT produced the concept document that set out the governance structure. The planning group was supported by an expert panel of six academic experts on climate change and an expert in citizen participation. Um, similarly, the German um, Climate Assembly, um, the commissioners also took a more supervisory role. Um, the commissioners were an, a civil society organization, um, BBK. I'm not very good at German, so I'm not going to attempt to um, spell that out, but um, BBK appointed um, three delivery organization agencies to um, organize and run the assembly. The delivery organisations undertook the day-to-day -day decision making, but BBK supervised the process via weekly meetings called the Coordination Circle. The Coordination Circle included the three agencies um, that organised and run the assembly um, and the scientific, um, a scientific advisory board. Governance was collaborative, but with defined roles, which were formalised by BBK early in the process. Okay, just come into the, um, the, the type where the commissioners were a little bit more hands off and took more of a sort of cons consultative role. The first is the Finnish climate, um, sorry, climate jury, which were, was initiated by researchers from the University of Turku and commissioned by the Ministry of the Environment. The commissioners took a more hands off approach um, than the previous cases and they appointed the researchers from the university to design and implement the jury. The scope was set in collaboration um, between the organizers and the ministry, but the design and implementation was very much led by the organizers and the ministry officials provided ad hoc advice um, and support via regular meetings. Jersey's Climate Assembly was commissioned by Jersey's government um, by a civil servants from the government's sustainability and foresight team within the Department of Strategic Policy and Planning and Performance. Similar to the Finnish case, the commissioners of Jersey's um, Climate Assembly were very hands off and entrusted the design and implementation to two delivery organisations, NCP and Involve, from um, located in the UK. In contrast, <clears throat> Excuse me. In contrast to the previous examples, a chair uh, examples a chair convener was appointed, who was a prominent individual from Jersey. An expert. The governance was um, supported by an expert advisory board um, to support the process. The next two assemblies um, were the type that uh, where the commissioners appointed a secretariat to lead on the governance. 
The first is the Irish Citizens Assembly, which was um, the first, um, it was actually the Irish, um, yes, yeah, sorry, the Irish Citizens Assembly that considered climate change as one of a, um, a series of five topics in 2017, and it occurred well before the other cases that we're talking about today. The Assembly was established by a resolution of the Irish Houses of Parliament, which set the scope for the, for the Citizens' Assembly in the five topics. The delivery on, on governance was then handed over to the Secretariat and comprised of, that comprised seconded civil servants and an independent chair. This structure of governance, led by the chair and secretariat, was formalised and common across the five topics and was supported by a steering group and an expert advisory panel that was different for each topic. Again, in, um, similar to the Irish um, uh, Citizens' Assembly, the Scot Scotland's Climate Assembly was led by a secretariat um, uh, comprising seconded civil servants and experts in citizens' assemblies to implement the process. Sorry, the Scottish Government commissioned this, um, uh, established a secretariat comprising seconded civil servants and experts in civil citizens' assemblies to implement the process. Two conveners were also appointed to media between the delivery organisations and the participants and represented the assembly to the media. Decision-making power overall was held by the Secretariat in collaboration with the steward stewarding group, evidence group, and two delivery organisations. Mm -hmm. However, <clears throat> it seems that the roles and responsibilities were not fully formalised. Decision-making was independent from the commissioners, i.e. the Scottish Government, although their advice was sought for and unforeseen decision, decisions, um, such as when they had to take the, um, the assembly online due to the COVID um, um, restrictions. And finally, um, for the French Citizens' Convention on, the, on Climate, um, this is quite different, governance was quite different to the other um, cases in that the, um, the, a, a multi-stakeholder group comprising 15 stakeholders was set up, uh, was set up um, to create a governance committee. Um, and these 15 stakeholders had diverse political views and interests. This governance committee retra retained decision-making control throughout the process. Um, the, the committee, during the actual, um, uh, operation of the um, convention, the committee was joined by two assembly members at each of their meetings. Details of the roles and responsibility of the governance committee were not formally set out at the initiation. Three guarantors appoint were appointed to monitor the independence of the process. So I'm just going to touch a little bit on our um, just checking time um, on the insights that um, we've taken from our, our review. Um, the first is um, the proximity of the, the commissioners um, remain to the decision making. Um, where a commissioner retains tight control, concerns can be raised about independence. Conversely, when commis commissioners are less directly involved, the extent to which the outcomes respond to their needs and therefore the potential influence of a climate assembly can be reduced. If insufficient viewpoints are represented, the perceived legitimacy of the process can be reduced. In contrast, it can be very difficult to manage too many viewpoints, slowing decision-making. However, early engagement of relevant interests and clearly defined rules can overcome potential conflicts, improving efficiency of decision-making amongst actors. We found that involving selected Assembly members in governance, governance during the delivery phase can improve decision making by providing a user view of the process and overcoming potential impact, impact, sorry, conflict amongst governance actors. Most climate assemblies have progressed without formalised, defined structures of governance. Roles and responsibilities for decision making have tended to evolve rather than be formally fully defined before the process begins. This can result in inefficient decision making and concerns about the legitimacy of the process. 
I've just got a few quotes here um, that I took from some of my interviews that I took. Um, that I undertook at the beginning of this year from um, various key informants. I think what really struck me was the, um, the everybody talked about, um, I think without re exception really, about the collaboration between the, um, the people involved um, in, in governance of um, climate assemblies. And that was obviously a really, really nice um, to reflect on. Um, and also the, um, uh, the the uh, uh, this sort of um, the uniqueness, I guess, in the in the Irish example, where they obviously had um, the structure uh, set up across the uh, the five um, the five uh, topics. So it was quite uh, um, the the key informant described it as a well oiled machine by the time it got to climate change, which I thought was a quite a nice quite a nice um, uh, quote there. Um, so I'll just finish on some recommendations that we came up with um, from the review. We felt, first of all, that the design and delivery team and major stakeholders should be brought in early to the governance arrangements to allow meaningful input to the design and operation of an assembly. Secondly, um, to engage a range of interests and perspectives, including assembly members and external stakeholders can ensure legitimacy and build trust and a sense of ownership in the process. Bringing actors who are skeptical or unsure about the process into governance arrangements will help generally increase their support and advocacy for the process, as well as bringing in their knowledge and expertise. As recommended by the OECD in their um, uh, um, publication at the end of last year, formalizing roles and responsibilities reduces the potential for conflict and enhances transparency. To date, the governance of many climate assemblies has been informal, evolving throughout the process, despite contracts being implemented for the appointment of external practitioners in several cases. This success of the process has relied on the goodwill and professionalism of actors involved, but the informality of um, generate a high risk of potential conflict in the future. Regular formal meetings between the commissioners, delivery organizations and governance actors can help ensure as the assembly meets the commissioner's needs and encourages its, its buy-in to the process. For example, the Danish planning group and the German co coordination circle. Governance arrangements that give Commission body or seconded civil servants significant decision making power may ensure that the assembly is more responsive to policy needs, but may also generate concerns about the independence of the process. I think I'm all right for time. I'll um, hand back to, um, to Mark now. Thank you very much, Jane. So this is a lot of information in a short time. So just first of all, to bring to your attention that you can look at uh, what Jane has produced by clicking on the link that Graham shared a minute ago. So um, for those who haven't already done this and want to have it open next to you or want to have a closer look afterwards, you're very, very welcome to do so. Next on our agenda really is to invite a panel on stage. But first I'll, I'll say that um, really Knaka wants to be able to help pose the right questions. So what we've seen now is a study of the governance model used in a series of different climate assemblies. But I think it's safe to say, Jane, and perhaps you can you can say if I'm right on this, that there has been a certain amount of experimentation done so far. So to put it slightly differently, uh, there has there is as of yet no fixed model for how to do governance in the best way. And I think what you've seen in Jane's presentation so far is that there are pros and cons to some of the different models. Now our hope is that very Yago, I'm just going to mute you, but welcome. <laughs> um, our, our hope is I just had the pleasure of seeing Yago uh, a few days ago, so it's good to see you on this call too. Um, I'll get my line of thinking back. I'm about to introduce our panel, who <laughs> will uh, hopefully be able to share some very specific experiences from within some of these governance bodies. This is what's so unique and so special about having this opportunity. We actually get to discuss now with some of the people who have actual hands-on experiences, 
what the pros and cons have been of these different governance models. So before I invite them on stage, I'm just gonna share my screen again. And with a bit of luck, you should be able to see now four names. And to these four names, I can add that Susie Townsend uh, works for Scottish government as a civil servant, and she was heading the secretariat of the Scottish Climate Assembly. Annika Aga was, is from Denmark and was working on the uh, Danish Climate Assembly. She's an associate professor Within, with a speciality within uh, citizens engagement at Roskilde University. And Chris Shaw is a parliamentary director and was involved in the Climate Assembly in the UK. And finally, Lise Deschotten, and Lise, please do correct me. I'm not very good at French. Um, she was an advisor to one of the co-chairs of the governance committee of the French Citizen Convention. And she's also actually one of our very close associates within Knocker. Now, the four of you have pride yourselves to be working in governance. What I'm really curious about is how conscious a decision it was to set up the governance structures that you had in place in the climate assembly that you were working on. And I'm also very curious to, see, to hear your reflections on what Jane has just presented to us. Does this mirror your own experience or do you want to elaborate on how you perceived being in a governance body from your position? So, there's no particular order to this. Um, I'm going to stop my screen sharing so we can see you all. And for the sake of simply starting somewhere, Susie, can I invite you to share uh, a few of your experiences? Yeah, thank you very much indeed for that. And thank you, Jane, for, for sharing um, that assessment. I thought it was really kind of interesting insight into um, what had what had perhaps happened and firstly i guess sitting um from the inside it didn't feel quite as structured as as you kind of helpfully laid out in, in the diagram um and i guess to me it felt not so much as though we fell into one of the three different approaches that you suggested but as though we did a little bit of of all of the three approaches and and you know, I think I think that just kind of affects the kind of messiness of, of these setups. The other thing that I would say, um, just as a kind of initial introduction on on what you have said, is that I guess for me, the commissioner wasn't really Scottish government, but was the Scottish Parliament, um, because the Scottish Climate Assembly came back about to an act in the Scottish Parliament and the report was commissioned by the Parliament and the and then the Parliament engaged a bit with the process, although perhaps not as much as in retrospect we would have liked them to have done. And so the Scottish Government had clearly an important role and many of us in the Secretariat came out of Scottish Government and Scottish Government funded the process, um, but the decision to have an assembly and what the assembly would be about was taken by the Scottish Parliament. And I think that's really kind of important distinction and, and therefore maybe speaks a little bit to where we kind of set, sat across the three different models that, that you proposed. The, the only other thing that I would say, kind of as initial kind of introduction at this stage, was that we had looked at what the Irish model had done and what the UK model had done and really wanted to learn from that. And in many ways, we might have liked to, to follow more closely what they had done. But there was also an issue around capacity. And I think that's something kind of worth thinking about that you might want to, you know, as a, as, a, as a group, you might think that one model or another is a better model in terms of legitimacy or transparency. But there's also um, a question around practicality. And certainly um, our experience was that at the time we were setting up the assembly, there were quite a lot of other assemblies being set up that there was 
a resource constraint both in terms of the practitioners, so in, in our case, um, involved in the democratic society who did a lot of the design for us, um, but also the experts. And I think it'd be interesting to hear what, what Chris says about the UK model, but I think our initial assumption had been that we would be much closer to the UK model in terms of the way we used our climate experts, our, our scientific experts. Um, but what we heard from the people that we wanted to, to work with was that they didn't have the amount of time which they would have needed to do if they had behaved in the way which I think they did for Climate Assembly um, UK. And therefore, in some ways, what the Secretariat did was um, we, we seeped into areas that, that there wasn't capacity from anybody else to do and therefore then took on responsibility which perhaps we hadn't intended to have at the outset and perhaps which wasn't um, as clearly transparent as I think in, in retrospect it would have been good for it to be. But the reason for that was a kind of lack of capacity and a desire to kind of get things done. And so I think, you know, when thinking about what is a perfect or a good model, it's also worth just thinking about but, but what's achievable and what's practical given the kind of constraints that are happening. I'll probably kind of leave my kind of in, initial thoughts for, for the time being at, at that. But just to say, I thought, you know, it was a really kind of interesting way of looking at, at the way all the different um, assemblies were, were constructed. And I think um, it, it, the, only, the only thing I would say is it, it suggests more kind of foresight and thought about it than, than actually happened at the time. It was much more like evolution as we kind of worked through the, the process. All right. Thank you very much, Susie. And you did, Susie just mentioned Chris. So Christian from the UK Climate Assembly, I think it might make sense to move on to you and to have a few reflections on how you perceived uh, your own process. And I'm curious as well to ask you, how conscious was the design of the governance body of the assembly that you were a part of? Uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, hello, uh, everyone. Good to see some of you again, um, Susie, uh, in, in particular. Thank you for um, your words, and Jane, thank you for your report, which um, uh, I found myself uh, agreeing with and recognising very much, particularly the, the words deeply collaborative, which seems to be a feature of um, not just the UK assembly, but uh, but all of them, uh, which is which is good to hear. Um, Mark, to answer your question, how did we come up with that design? Well, we were a bit like Susie, slightly making it up as we went along. We'd had experience doing one smaller uh, citizens assembly uh, in the UK Parliament beforehand in 2018, and uh, that was helpful. Uh, it was contracted out to the same contractor as it happened, uh, but this was a much bigger scale uh, involving many more people, six um, select committees, and we were conscious of the need to get the process right. So we did spend a lot of time ensuring that uh, it was process perfect as far as it's possible. That was, you know, I felt it was my job as the sort of the link between the, the politicians and the contractors who delivered it my job was to ensure that the, the process was, was perfect whilst making sure it delivered what the politicians wanted. And, to do, and that's why we came up with the, the two uh, different panels, uh, an academic advisory panel to ensure that the content was, was really right. Uh, and also the stakeholder panel, advisory panel, uh, which had a, a political element there because I mean, because the issue um, of climate change and indeed participatory democracy as well has greater resonance on the left of the political spectrum, I think, uh, we were conscious that in, in, in making it a success, uh, we would have to make it um, credible with uh, you know, the right of uh, uh, the spectrum as well. And that's why we, we invested a lot of time getting on board um, the right wing think tanks and, and indeed the press uh, and indeed the politicians as well. And that helped us uh, when it came to presenting the findings to ensure that it just wasn't shot down as a, uh, you know, as a, as a lobby or an activist organization. Uh, I mean, the, 
the fact that uh, Extinction Rebellion were calling for us a climate assembly at the same time uh, actually didn't help us at all uh, because uh, it sort of has turned some against the idea in the first place. And we tried to get Extinction on, Rebellion on board uh, as well to get their support un unsuccessfully. Um, so we did give a lot of uh, thought to getting the structures right to preserve the independence of the process. Uh, and so that was one main reflection. Uh, the other thing I'd pick on, well, two, two, two things I'll just pick up on, on Jane's report. Uh, one thing was, uh, I agree, there's the potential for conflict if the roles aren't sufficiently well defined. Ours weren't well defined. And uh, actually, I mean, we worked very well together with the contractor, so they didn't need to be. And the politicians were content to be quite hands off. Uh, and so they were they were content. We've got a tradition in the UK Parliament, the officials, us officials are trusted to be politically impartial, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So we didn't have that that problem. But I can see in other contexts, it, it could be an issue. So we we didn't waste a lot of time defining roles. And as it turned out, we didn't need to. But yeah, it, it might be helpful in, in future. And the second reflection was, was just on the the absence we we made a decision not to have a chair like they did in in ireland uh, a high profile sort of chair and spokesperson and uh, we took that to preserve the political independence of the um, assembly and i think it was the right call but it sometimes it left us as officials slightly exposed uh, particularly when there was a, a general election called uh, during the um the the, the preparatory phase for the climate assembly and we had no political cover for any of the decisions we took and so it left people like me and the contractors sometimes exposed directly to the press in a way which was quite uncomfortable uh, potentially uh, and, and just so on a few occasions it would have been helpful to have I think a chair and particularly in promoting it that's the final thing I'll say uh, a, a, a high profile chair may have helped um, a lot with the, uh, the promotion. I think we underestimated the amount of effort uh, media officers uh, and stakeholder engagement people would need to put into gaining a public profile for the assembly. We did that, we had to co-op David Atmer uh, to do that as well, which helped enormously. But um, it, you know, to do a high profile, that would, that would certainly help and that gives it greater impact. So I'll stop, I'll stop there for now and I'm interested to hear other people's reflections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and already now I'm seeing a pattern of, of dilemmas that uh, we're trying to navigate when setting up good governance. But uh, let's get back to that. Uh, I feel like handing the word now to my countryman, countrywoman, Annika. Uh, Annika. Now, I've already asked this question to the last two, but I'm feeling tempted to do the same. I know that for this particular climate assembly, actually, uh, my own uh, organization was involved. But nonetheless, would you put a few words to how conscious of a decision it was to set up the governance structure? Um, seen from yeah, your I, and I can yes. just say I was uh, appointed as the expert in citizen engagement. So I was so I was part of the expert committee. And, uh, and we entered the process when the Danish Board of Technology had won the tender and they already had um, outlined the process about how the Danish citizen assembly should run. But, but we challenged that model somehow because one thing that we discussed very much was this is a democratic invasion. It's the first time that we have in Danish, we call it Thing. So the word thing comes from the Icelandic thing where the local leaders would gather and discuss um, issues that mattered for them. We were very eager to understand what was the novelty of this new deliberative fora because we thought that of course, the Danish Board of Technology, they were very experienced in conducting consensus conferences, uh, town hall meetings and so on. But playing with the words of thing, what, what did that imply to us? So we talked 
quite a lot about that, where in the media there was some crit critics whether we uh, the process was outlined too tight or too narrow to a political uh, agenda, and also this that they had to meet uh, a group of the um, uh, citizens would meet every now and then along the way with uh, the commissioners. That was also criticized in the broad media. And there are pros and cons uh, of that design. So we talk very much about the implications of the design choices that were taken. Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Or what are the challenges and what are the, um, the forces or potentials of aligning the process very tight to a political process. As we saw in the Irish model, somehow th that can be a very good thing because then you have political commitment and you can use the input from the citizens assembly. So in a way that can be a good thing, thing. but if it's too narrow, then you, you lose the potential of getting out of the box perspectives from ordinary citizens. So it is really a balance about how should we frame the question? How should the process be to the commissioning body? Should it be close? Should it be more at an arm length? Um, and how should the balance between the mini public in the citizen assembly be uh, in contrast to the maxi public, or as we saw in the French um, citizen assembly, they also managed somehow to uh, involve the midi public or the green associations. In Denmark, I thought in a way it was quite impressive how far they got with very few money or a very low budget. So in that way, it was in two stages and the first stage was very tight to a political process. And uh, the critics would claim that the politicians were that engaged in uh, receiving response uh, or commenting on the recommendations. But it depends a bit as many of the new papers that are being made in the NACA network, are we perceiving these uh, results short term and long term from a half full perspective of the glass? Or half empty. So in that way, I think that we have uh, started a very good process. We have also uh, tested some very good hybrid models of engaging. We got Corona that was in the beginning a really big challenge for all of the citizen uh, assemblies around Europe. But we also learned that it had actually some really good. Uh, uh, it had some potential that's about that it was easier for some groups to attend, even though that you have babies or children or you didn't have to travel that much, but it was also challenging for some of the older generations. So there were again pro and cons. So I think I will stop there. So again, it's every every choice, every design choice you take has um implication. And I, I and uh, and uh, and we have to discuss whether these citizens' climate assemblies are mainly in order to legitimate certain policy uh, decisions and to create uh, collective support for tough decisions, or is it rather that we want new perspectives in? Well, if we do so, then we maybe have to play even more with the format. Uh, about how we hear expert witnesses and so on. But that's all for me for now. And that's a very good start, Annika. Thank you very much. So, Lise, I am trying to, I'm going to try to attempt to pronounce your last name, Lise de Sotel, because I want to make sure that I'm doing it right. So you can start by correcting me and then please do share with us the role that you played in the climate assembly in France and what, what you feel of the conversation so far. Thanks, Mark. And let me congratulate you because most of the time French people do not get my name right. And you did. So oh. not so bad for a, a Danish man. Um, and I'd like to first maybe thank Jane for the, the work she's been doing. Uh, it's uh, 
it's very good work, especially on the side of what the governance of the French uh, Climate Citizens Convention uh, on Climate was. Um, and, and listening to all these presentations and, and coming back to the question about the conscious choice of a governance model, I'm, I'm wondering how much of that choice there is, of course, you have to deal with constraints. And most of the time for public authorities, this is one of the first question about money, time, the resources you want to dedicate to the process. Then the, I think it's the, the choice is also influenced by the political circumstances that led to the process, who pushed for that, um, and, and who ultimately ends up being the, the public authority saying, OK, we're going to do that process, uh, like the select committees in the UK or the government or parliament in Scotland. So it, it plays a role and in France, especially the fact that it was um, there are many people in French that claim the, the fatherhood or the motherhood of this idea of having a climate assembly, but what history has uh, uh, written down for the moment is the fact that it's this joint collective of yellow vests and green activists that jointly push for a citizens assembly on climate, but also a democratic renewal and the costs of living. And they were the one that entered into a, a political negotiation with the team of the president uh, himself, trying to, to, to get an agreement. And the negotiation was also entered by an institution in France that is the Economic, Social and Environmental Council uh, that we call the CESE or ESSEC. And, and this tripartite negotiation led to uh, directly the governance of the of the citizens convention there is a very good article in french unfortunately for the moment from uh, jean-michel fournier who is a researcher but also was a member of the um, governance committee and he really shows how um how the governance organization of the citizens convention is really a result of four months negotiations between people that have very different perspectives and goals behind this assembly. Uh, for instance, for the ESSEC people, it was about making sure that the process would be hosted and organized by them uh, because they wanted to become the place where citizen participation was organized because they were also under the threat of being uh, canceled as an institution because it's been a discussion in France for many years that we don't need this institution, etc. So they wanted the citizens to save them. They didn't want too many citizens also because they want to keep their councillors that are elected through a very complex system in France, et cetera. So anyway, just to say that we also have to look at the somehow power games that sometimes can happen behind the scenes. And in France, it was very much the case for this one. But I also think that the governance models are influenced by the, the, the institutional cultures where they are set in, depending on how, how much institutions are um, uh, have the habit of dialoguing with NGOs or corporations, etc. I remember from listening to another learning call on the uh, Finnish citizens' jury, I was very shocked by, I, I realized how much we come from different political and institutional systems and how it, it's going to anyway impact. So every time we have discussions about what is the best model, what what should be how do we make sure it's more independent etc i think the question is looking at a specific context what can be achieved in that context given the fact that part of the equation is a something that cannot be changed somehow and so, sorry I'm, I'm being quite long so that's what i'm going to say on that part and for uh, france yes it was a, a very uh, a model where power was concentrated it had um it allowed us, for instance, or the fact that it was very heavy to maneuver made every decision we had to take very long to take and sometimes very hard. Uh, so we ended up being not ready when the process started, but then being not ready also helped us be more flexible and adapt to the changing circumstances like social strikes or the COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, pandemic. So somehow you you can have ups and downs uh, with with those uh, systems but it's true that the the model we had with many stakeholders 
was created to protect the commissioner, uh, so the president, from being accused to take one side or by say, saying like he's going, he's giving something to the climate activists. He was also giving it to an institution and we had members in the governance committee. We had one member, for instance, she comes, she's a representative for extractive industries. And she was actually the first media target uh, when there were many questions around the first session about why is she on board of that governance committee due to the fact that she represents those interests. But then at the end of the process, many things had happened and people were, uh, some people in a very specific part of society that is like the bulk work against of people against climate action they started to say but there were many climate activists in that process it's not normal etc so the the story and the image was always a, a bit spinning or being changed depending on who was talking but it also helped somehow to protect the process by saying but those people were around the table and then some people started to lie, saying, for instance, experts saying that the interest of the farming industries were not heard during the process, that we had those people coming, but then they decided to lie on national television, say, saying they didn't come, etc. So, sorry, I'm going to stop here. I think that the model we had was a direct result of what happened in France just before Yellow Vest, Great National Debate, etc., I could not see any other model that could have been developed under those circumstances, but I'm not sure it's the best model yet because it has been under a lot of criticism. Okay, thank you very much, Lise. So we have a lot of complexity to navigate here. I'm, I'm sure that for those listening, it might be difficult to, um, to fully grasp the complexity or the intricacies of each of these models, but we're going to start now a bit more of a conversation. So I'll invite my colleague, Stina, to pin all of all of us on the screen and we'll kind of open it up now to be a bit more of a conversation uh, between you and I'll warm up to receiving questions from the rest of you out there as well so if you're starting to think about interesting questions uh, you can start jotting them down um, but I will try to get you started with a few questions first because first of all it seems to me that uh, it has been quite different governance models and they've always arisen out of a specific context. But I think one very specific, interesting question would be, what, what would you have done differently looking back now? Um, and I'm open to this being a bit more of an interactive co active conversation. So feel free to, um, to raise your hand or bid in and, and start the conversation if you feel particularly drawn by this question. Yes, please go for it. Sorry, I'm going first because I hate that question, uh, <laughs> to be honest. No, it's very hard once you've done such a, it, it feels like, you know, these towers you build and if you take one piece, that everything will tumble down. Uh, so it's hard to, to know how much if you change one aspect, it's not going to impact others. Uh, but one thing I can think of is the fact that we were working based on there, there was very little practice at that level and we only looked at the the irish model at that time so we only had this reference point and i think that's why we sort of tried to build something that was also different um but thinking about that i'm thinking about all the people who are now organizing new climate assemblies etc and the the very latest ones the the one that are not around the table here and i really wonder that people are actually not doing differently from what we've done from those three models so far, uh, especially I'm thinking the Spanish and, and Austrian climate assemblies. And I wonder, maybe it's a question back to you and to everyone, but why is that? What does that tell us? And for me, I have a question like, does it mean that people and organizers want to retail power by keeping very close a secretary? It's not even independent secretariat. It's uh, they want to retain the the people organizing the thing in their close circle. So, sorry, a question back to everyone, but what do we see happening and what does it tell us? Thanks, Lise. And I saw your hand go up, Chris. Now you have two questions. You can choose which one to address. Oh, I was just thinking about the first one. Sorry, Lise, <laughs> to focus on, I'll let somebody else take that one. But uh, it's, no, it is a good one to think about. I just need some more time to think about it. Um, the, the thing that I'm, might have done differently and I'd be interested in the French experience actually of getting assembly members onto the governing 
committee. Uh, that's not something that we did uh, just because there was quite a clear idea of what we wanted the assembly to discuss and deliver. But when we got to Birmingham and uh, engaged with the assembly members, you know, there was a clear a sense that they wanted some agency in the process and that seemed like a, a good thing to do to help generate you know their um, support and enthusiasm and give them some uh, responsibility and so we did provide them some time um, to address anything else at the end so for example the question that they were asked was how to get to net zero by 2050 a controversial question that we weren't asking them was should that be 2035 or, or 2030 and so we left them a bit of space at the end to say is there anything else and you know to exactly to address that question and that 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 sort of came from the assembly members but we didn't have a formal way of including assembly members in the process so uh, that's something that i would definitely give more time to um consider and, and uh, equally I'd be inter interested to hear other views on how that was done where it was done and uh, and and how it's done successfully given that you've got a hundred assembly members and who's representative of the assembly members thank you thank you very much Chris um, you're pointing to another few good questions here but I think before we go on I, I want to give Annika and Susie a chance to to put your uh, thoughts in so that is uh, about what would we have done differently? Is that the question? Yes, and by now, if you get more inspired by one of the other things coming up, you are also welcome to jump on it. Yeah, I think uh, the, it depends very much for me, as I said before, what is the main objection? What do you want to gain with the citizen assembly? What role should it have? And what role should it have in relation to the elected politicians? Because um, or is it mainly also to create more awareness on the, on this agenda? Because I think what is challenging in many of the cases that we heard about, and thank you for attending for this excellent review, it's really helpful, is that in many cases, the maxi public is not so much. Uh, it, it, it is as we use a lot of energy in, in selecting the really nice processes, the good and the very uh, uh, different uh, witnesses and so on. But how do we secure or how do we link to more, uh, to, the, to, to the media more in more general so we create more awareness? And there I think actually that there is something interesting to be learned from the French model. Uh, and I would love to hear more about that because they, they had a more free format, format or template so that the members could by themselves arrange um, discussions or that the uh, green associations or lobby associations could come with proposals about what the, what the um, assembly should, uh, should uh, talk about. And there they came actually a, a whole publication with I think more than 1,000 suggestions and that's what they call the needy public so in that way a lot of the uh, public deliberations was mobilized but they had also more budget and funding and i think if i could do something differently i would hope that the Danish model would get more funding and not only uh, a rather limited uh, amount it got and then i would make more sure to mobilize more strategically uh media and the media public that was what i would do differently or push more towards you. thank you annika susie i'd love to hear your thoughts as well before we broaden the discussion um i i was i was really struck by something annika said in her introductory remarks about whether we're asking for the assembly to legitimize decisions or whether we're looking for new perspectives and i think certainly at the stage that we were initially organizing scotland's climate assembly we were at a point where just to have an assembly was something new and innovative and 
I think a lot of the kind of initial attention was around the, the process of, of having an assembly. And I think what I would do differently now, if I were to be organizing an assembly again, would be to be much clearer about what the the purpose of the assembly was in terms of, yes, of course, the idea is to have a representative cross-section of, of people from Scotland contributing, but what's going to happen to what they do? Are they are they doing as Annika suggested, approving or not approving something which is my sense of what happened at least with some parts of what happened in Ireland, that it was then going to go forward to a referendum, or are you genuinely trying to unpack this big issue and trying to get different ideas? And I think having an idea of what's going to happen to the outcome. So we knew from the outset that the outcomes of Scotland's Assembly would go to the Scottish Parliament and that Scottish ministers would be required to respond. And we thought that that was really um, quite progressive and gave a lot of legitimacy to Scotland's Climate Assembly and it absolutely did. But I think if I were to have my time again, I would be much clearer about what sort of budget is involved with this, what sort of commitment is there from, from ministers to implement some or any of the recommendations? How is that process going to be developed? Because I think understanding of not what the outcomes are going to be, but the, the shape of the outcomes and, and um, what's going to happen to the outcomes would have had some, some effect on some of the decisions that we made around the design and the format and so that's that's the first thing is to kind of think about the end points and how we manage the end points and I think rather belatedly we appreciated that the secretariat couldn't finish immediately after the assembly finished because there was a whole kind of process of engagement and and telling people about it that somebody had to do um, but I don't think that was clear. I know it wasn't clear to us at the start. And so understanding the whole kind of arc of the process, I think, really kind of helps understand what sort of structures, so knowing for each different assembly, what you're going to do with whatever comes out of it before you start, I think is, is quite important in terms of structure and design. And then kind of feeding into that, um, something around what, what Chris said around how you give the, the assembly members themselves agency. And I think our assembly members often felt that there was a lot of work to cover, but they didn't really know where they were trying to get to. And sometimes, you know, to be very honest, it was because we weren't entirely sure yet. And we wanted to give them time to be able to influence the direction of travel that we wanted to hear from the members if they felt that there were things that they particularly wanted to cover or speakers they wanted to hear from or issues that they wanted us to include. But by leaving things open, that for some members was frustrating and they didn't know what, what was going on from week to week in the direction and whether this bit of work was the thing they should be focusing on or not. And so, I think trying to get that balance between having a clear structure of what you're trying to do and sharing it and agreeing it with the members early on, but still giving them the agency to, to adapt and change, but knowing what's going to happen with the out, output so that whatever comes out at the end is useful for that process, which is which the commissioner has set out. Um, and I know we didn't do it, but there was another assembly in Scotland called Citizens Assembly of Scotland. It was looking much more at the future of Scotland and covered all sorts of issues, including um, very briefly kind of environment and climate change. And they had a members group who fed in throughout the process much more in terms of the design. Um, so that was something which we actively considered but partly because we did everything entirely online, working out how you could ensure that that group of members was representative 
in the same way that the total membership of the assembly had been carefully selected to be representative um, wasn't something which we we felt that we were really able to deal with in the, with the constraints of being online and 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 so on um, but it's something which i guess if i were doing it again i would want to think about again how do you give members a, a clearer um, voice into that process okay thank you susan so uh, time passes very quickly. I'm going to say to everyone out there that if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand. And in the meantime, I'm going to pose in another question. I'm going to direct it to you, first of all, Jane. Now, it seems to me that um, a lot of these uh, climate assemblies were uh, set up with a different uh, initial uh, question or a different initial purpose. But really, I'm sitting with the question, what is the actual purpose of the governance body? What should the governance body first and foremost ensure, because we've had a few things coming up now. We've talked about agency of the actual uh, participants involved directly. But we'd also had a little bit of focus on the neutrality, given that you want it to be uh, interesting to the entire political spectrum. We talked about how to make it relevant to uh, the decisions that you bring out to, to give it value into the political process. A word that comes up for me too is integrity. but there seems to be a lot of things that you're trying to balance when designing a governance structure. So Jane, you've interviewed quite a few people now that have been involved in this. What seems, if you can bottom line it, to be the actual real purpose of the governance body? Is it to manage all of this? Or can you make it even, can you say it in a more simple way? Or, and is there more? So that's like the biggest question I could possibly ask for you right there. <laughs> nice and easy one, thank you. Um, I think um, so. The so kind of like the the most basic sort of function of the of governance, I guess, is to um, is the kind of sort of day to day design and and implementation those day to day um, day to day uh, decisions that um, get an assembly um, started and and uh, the process undertaken. Um, there's then those kind of I think what's happened in the review, well, I think you're asking me what's, what's uh, to reflect on um, the review as opposed to what I think um, it should be, I think, um, is that that's how it started. And then, and then governance, um, then the actors, um, governance actors have sort of realized and it's evolved that they have to kind of incorporate these other things as, as it's gone along. So it's really um, interesting to hear um, people's reflections on how um, governance has affected um, the impact of um, an assembly, for example, um, and the legitimacy um, and also public awareness. But I don't think that's how it starts out or has started out. I think it's much more kind of, let's get this thing started and, um, and done and then all those other things start being impacted. Um, but you're right that um, the, the start of um, each, each assembly has started from very different places. Um, and I think I just wanted to touch on what, what Lise said um, in her, in her um, uh, reflections as well at, this, at the start when she was talking about um, how governance structures depend on who pushed for um uh, an assembly and who um and then who commissioned it who got it started i think without kind of exception when i did the interviews everybody talked about the process of being commissioned who who it was that started it and that was really interesting to me i, I thought they're all and it, it never really occurred to me before i started talking i uh, started doing the interviews that it that governance really depended on it started at the point of um, conception, if you like, of, the, of who, who initiated the whole process. And that really determined how it was structured. That's going a little bit off piece of your actual question. Um, so um, in terms of the role of governance, it does it, um, uh, definitely um, cover those extra things. But in, in terms of looking back on the um, assemblies that have happened, I think that has that has kind of come in afterwards 
and develop over the course of the process. And that I'm not meaning that to be unkind. I just think that's like a how how it's how it's um, been as necessary. But I suppose looking forward, as Lise was sort of talking about how what's happening now then how is the how are those learnings um taking shape um so that might be one of the questions that we think about in the breakout room thank you jane it's a big question i asked you to, to try to answer what i'm going to do now is i'm going to add one more question and i'll suggest we do a quick round on it because we're getting close to a break so the question is based on the conversation we've had so far what should we be digging into when we go into breakout rooms after uh, a break What's the most interesting part of these conversations that we could look into more deeply? Now, Susie, I'm going to give you the word first. And feel free to add your reflections on some of the other things that have come up so far. Um, I, I, guess, I guess for me, and maybe just sitting where I am at, at this point of the process, this question of impact, how can you make sure that the governance structure maximizes the impact of the assembly would be a key question for me. That is very concise and clear. Thank you, Susie. Um, well, feel free, I could point to you, Annika, perhaps. I think that Susie actually pointed a very uh precise on on what I think is interesting too because I'm very interested in the design choices we take when we uh, design a citizen assembly and of course we want somehow that it should both come up with new interesting things we also want that it shall create support on tough decisions and we also want that it uh, creates broad uh, uh, awareness. So, in a way, it is also about what criteria do we use when we assess impact. And there, it's interesting because there are impacts here and now. There are impacts on the participants. There are impacts on on the policies that are being developed. But maybe that's too short to to assess right now because they are all rather fresh and new. The citizens. Uh, assemblies that we have been talking about. So, so it's something about the output and the outcome, the short and the long term impacts on different uh, axes and the level. That's uh, what I find to be very interesting to discuss because somehow we use a lot of resources on these formats. And are these resources then well used? A scarce public money is that well used in these formats or should we do something completely else so we have to be very sharp on the benefits and the trade-offs for different design choices if we choose to use these formats that seems to be very popular both at national level and at least in Denmark we're seeing more and more also on the municipal level so uh, there are yeah that's what I want to say. Okay, thank you, Annika. So, Chris, what are your thoughts? Well, in in terms of things to to dig into further, um, I mean, I I think um, the the point about uh, the uh, con, uh, the commissioner uh, really dictating to an extent the the structures is is a is a good one and it's uh, that jane you mentioned and i guess i didn't really think about it but it's, i guess it's obvious i, I suppose on, on reflection that uh, the commissioner must have a strong influence there um and uh but equally it's important that there are other players involved as well so whether there is a perfect uh, structure i i my hunch is that i i doubt if there is a perfect one that you know, should be bolted on. Uh, I suspect that uh, the the government structure might need to be influenced by the political tradition in the commissioning organisation, be that government or parliament or something different. And but nonetheless, uh, there were probably some principles that the governance structure should abide by 
whatever the actual details are, the personalities and the organisations, there must be some some principles which help to ge generate legitimacy. Uh, and this there was was a good one, I think, uh, in terms of all the things the uh, the governance body does. And maybe that needs some more uh, thought. Uh, potentially, with separating out certain things like delivery from impact. And like you say, Jane, that, that the, the, the delivering impact sort of comes later in the piece uh, I found. And, uh, but like I put in the chat, in hindsight, we should have devoted more time on impact right from the start, but maybe that requires a little a different uh, governing structure um, from the start. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, Susie, I see your hand, so feel free to add a small comment. And then um, I, I just wanted to um, agree with what Chris has just said <laughs> and say something about perhaps um, cutting cutting assemblies a bit of slack to 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 have maximum impact that I guess there's a bit of a risk that as 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 we kind of get more involved in it ourselves and become um a bit more kind of enthusiastic and um that that we are become very focused on is this the best way or could we have done it differently or and i think there's a risk and i think it it's slightly happened with scotland's climate assembly that um even before the assembly started we had some criticism that for some reason that, that there was, I mean, it, it was Extinction Rebellion who said um, that they didn't think that the process was being run properly before we had even got going. And having got them into quite, got themselves into quite a technical place of saying that they, they didn't think that there was some aspect of it being done as well or in the way that they would have liked, then their, their effort then effectively detracted from the outcome of the assembly and made it much harder for them to then come behind the assembly and the assembly's outcomes and, and really support them. And I think there's, you know, for, for, for specialists um, and practitioners, it, it is important that we think about how could, what what are the what are the implications of some of the choices we make and what are the, the what are would potentially the best choices to make but there's there's also something around not devaluing the process and, and recognizing the real strengths of having citizens assemblies and they are still relatively new and exciting um additions to the democratic process and that we we should be supportive of of that process and and the outcomes that are coming through and and yes always trying to improve them and make them better but i guess um i, f I feel it was a shame that that when we got to the end and we had our 80 recommendations which many of which i think extinction rebellion would have been completely supportive of because they had got into a position of, of criticizing the assembly, it made it very difficult for them then to call for government to in, 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 in move forward with some of their recommendations. And so I think thinking within a kind of practitioner community about how do we do things best, but also within a kind of wider community, actually involving the public and giving people the chance to learn and deliberate and to make recommendations is, is such an, an important innovation. And by, by striving for perfection, we shouldn't undermine um, the, the, whole, the whole process. I guess it's just a, a, a bit of kind of caution there that we should be um, celebrating the work of the assemblies yes susie i think we're luckily uh, i think we're all supportive of that actually but it's a very good input i want to make sure please you get the word before we do a short break so Lise, now a few things have been in the air but still we'll be back to breakout rooms after the breakout what would you suggest focusing on um maybe i'll i'll follow what susie has been saying i totally agree with this idea of cutting them, cutting those processes some slack, the, the gap between the expectations that we keep adding to those processes and what they can actually deliver sometimes is also a bit too 
too big on the part of the commissioners, but also on the part of civil society. Um, so I think it's important to pause and to keep seeking to improve the model, to get uh, good quality processes, to empower those processes, because it's also what we're discussing. But also maybe to take a step back. And I think that um, we reached that point in the discussion also because we're basing the discussion only on what happened. Uh, so, and that's also the limits of the work we're, we're doing with GNOCA at the moment. The fact that we are focusing on, on past processes and that the latest processes have been somehow replicating the oldest one. So my suggestion for the discussion maybe would be to try to open up a bit our minds and, and consider what kind of governance innovations could be developed, not only within those processes, but a bit bigger. Uh, we, we, have, we see that now the discussion about climate assemblies is also moving about institutionalization or how to make those processes more permanent. There are also other people considering we should not engage in, in that way, but maybe look for hybridization of those models with other processes where we can get the maxi public involved, etc. So I would maybe try to go in that direction where in the breaking out uh, in the breaking rooms, we, we could maybe have a discussion about with ideas and stuff that we could come up with. So oh, personally, I'm, I would be very interested in hearing what people think could could help improve and develop maybe a new model and new practices. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I mean, this was a short um, round so far. We um, have decided so that after a break, we'll come back, dig into some questions in breakout rooms to engage the wider audience, and then come together at the end to share some of the reflections on what we have, what we've heard. So this is a way of broadening the conversation and continuing the conversation after a break. So it's not over, but what is over now is uh, the first round of the panel. So thank you, everyone. You deserve a break. I suggest we come back at 16.35 and uh, jump right in. And we'll find a way to summarize some of the th things you just said and added as headlines for some breakout rooms. So see you all in nine minutes and thank you. We are recording this last session, so that'll be added to the first part of our recording. But we have 24 minutes to hear a little bit about what happened in the different breakout rooms and share some, um, some wisdom, hopefully. I want to add a question into this mix now as, you, uh, as we go through the rooms, which is basically what advice can we take forward to people who are uh, looking into setting up a climate assembly? So, of course, First of all, now you feel free to share what you've talked about, but I want everyone to have that question in the back of their head. Um, so I'm suge I'll suggest we go from room to room. We didn't ask you to pick someone to be a spokesperson. So this is gonna be self-organized, but I was gonna say room number one, Sine, what is room number one? Um, criteria for impact. Okay, so is there someone from the room that talked about criteria for impact who's willing to summarize some of your findings? It was the room with Enik and Jane. Yeah, I can, I can do it. And then you, Walter and uh, Jane, and you must su uh, supplement me and the uh, young woman from Sweden also. Um, we talked about uh about um when these processes well, well we talked about a lot of things and one of the things we talked about that didn't have to do with criteria of impact but a little bit anyway was that uh, if we use these democratic innovations on a municipal level how can we then secure that the uh governance of the citizen assembly is designed in a way so it reach maximum impact and so uh, that it is viewed as a legitimate process. And there we talked about this uh, Irish example where they have some guarantors for the process that was a retired judge. So who would be, who could it be at a local level? What would be the criteria for selecting a person that could somehow uh, stand as uh, chair for the process. That was one thing. 
the other thing was that we were also a bit inspired by uh, by the iris model that had more money and so on but for this uh, uh governance device where they have the house of oysters that kind of followed the process so for the for securing the impact on the short term but also on the little longer term it would be nice to think more wisely in the design how can we make a entity or uh, somebody who follows what's going on with the recommendations and how are they being addressed to the last thing i would say was also that we talked about how important it is that the decision makers somehow respond to the recommendations that that is crucial even though if it's a civil society uh actor who uh, commissions this uh, climate assembly but this re the response for decision makers has to be thought in from the beginning so jane or walter or the stockholm lady supplement me if i've forgotten something no i think you are very complete thank you annika <laughs> thanks annika uh, that was great annika thank you i think room number two was on commissioning or the commissioner's impact uh, and i know chris was in that room and i know this is also where percy was in the middle of a sentence when we ended so either of you or Mayu as well who's there feel free to share what we talked about chris go ahead okay but do add in percy your uh, pearl of wisdom that we've got saved up um so yeah just to pick up actually from annika what you were saying about the importance of of action um yes we've we sort of concluded with that thought as well really important to uh, have some sort of um uh, response to the recommendations and i think to do that to wind it back to the uh, impact of the commissioning body um we discussed how important it is to have um, the, the the government uh, on board if they weren't the commissioner directly important to have uh, some sort of government involvement right at the start as well as um, uh, a wide range of, uh, of of interest potentially to to help legitimacy and also this is maybe my thought is to offset any criticism of the uh, the assembly at the end if anyone's wanting to criticize it they'll say well you know it was a fix who was on the commissioning body who who which 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 people were involved you know that was the bit that we had to get right so it was a really broad section so we protected it against that sort of criticism then we then we talked about the media and how important it is to get the media involved you know at the start and uh, not not that they should be involved in on the the governing body but uh, there should be some way of the governing body engaging with the media, you know, from the start and right through and, and at the end. Um, but then finally, and this Mark was saying this, that um, uh, the even with a, a government input, uh, it was hard to get uh, politicians involved, genuinely engaged. And that was really key to a successful uh, process. And um, we discussed various ways via the media to engage uh, politicians, um, but that was the uh, that was seen as key to to success and a difficult thing to achieve. I don't think we answered it necessarily, um, but uh, that's where we that's where we finished up. I think unless there was anything else that I've missed. All right, I think the silence has a no, but it was very good, Chris. Thank you. Um, just a thought while I remember to say it for those of you who are interested, uh, there's a lot of interesting questions and answers actually in the chat as well that happened throughout our conversation today. So for anyone interested in just peering through the, the chat, feel free to, to do that too. But having said that, I think the third one, the third group was on principles for legitimacy. Um, can someone take us through what you talked about? Do you want me to jump in? I? And we're actually the fourth group, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, well, uh, most of the time we weren't talking about governance, actually. We kept going all over the place, but that's another issue. Uh, and I think we were um, trying to think at various points between what is, is the right principled thing to do 
And then what's the thing you might need to do for pragmatic reasons? And we're thinking, for example, you know, independence is a really important value, but many of the assemblies are really quite very closely tied to government. And so that quest that raises questions about independence but but there's a value for being close to government as well or there, or there can be so it's really quite difficult to get that balance right again diversity of governing of people on governing bodies is a really good thing in terms of in terms of bringing in different views but also to get buy-in which which someone else was talking about in the earlier in, in in an earlier group and then there was a lot of discussion around the importance of having citizens as part of governance um, again not just because it was the the right thing to do but also because of the value that they bring a different type of perspective and I think having so there was a there was a lot of and then we talked about all sorts of other things as well but I think those were the sorts of things that we went backwards and and, and forwards on that kind of what does it really mean to be independent what is it and how do we and how do we how do we achieve that so um I think that's where we were anyone want to throw in anything else Nope, I think that's where it, I take silence as golden. Oh, Danica wants to say something. Just very briefly, I think what, what you just uh, reported and said about our discussion was also intertwined with the discussion and how far citizens should be brought into the overall processes of defining principles of legitimacy to start with. And that was sort of one point of departure uh, that we took. Um, I can't, what's the right combination how far should citizens not only like attend those assemblies but also be involved in the design and even designing the principles of or co-designing the principles of legitimacy of these assemblies just a minor well, thank you okay good points all around so that leaves the last group whether it's group four or three but let's see it's expectation management really that was a the summary of the headline, but what did you actually end up talking about? Who wants to share? Yeah, maybe I can start and if anyone wants to compliment. Um, so we were five uh, with uh, Magali, Heda, Elena and, and Susie, and we were discussing this uh, gap of and the management of expectations around climate assemblies. Uh, so we came back to those expectations, uh, listing, uh, first of all, the expectations of the people who are calling for climate assemblies and campaigning for them. And that can be also different from uh, the people commissioning them. Um, but those people tend to also set the, the, the level quite high in terms of expectation. There, were, there are, of course, the expectations of the participants, the members of climate assemblies, who tend to be growing during the process. Um, and, and so when we discussed them for the first ones, uh, the expectations of the, the, the people calling for, for them, uh, we realized we also needed to look at the people who are not campaigning for them, or uh, and we, we had a, a dive thanks to Lina, who has conducted uh, some work for Knoka on the attitudes of policy actors towards climate assemblies. We also realized that the fact that main civil, uh, civil society organizations such as big climate NGOs tend to be in a wait and see attitude or sometimes have very strong fears ag against uh, those processes uh, or uh, let's say an assessment of the risks that can be debunked or can be uh, change when you present them with facts. Uh, and I really invite everyone to look at uh, what's on Knokia website on that. But the fact that those actors do not contribute to the discussion on the preparation of assemblies can, can be somehow detrimental to those processes and that somehow we need to have um, more of those people who are experienced in the way of dealing with policymakers and dealing with policies on climate action. They, they really have a, a voice that can be uh, that can be useful in terms of preparation of the process and during the processes. And uh, uh, Alina was quoting what uh, the Spanish Climate Assembly has been doing in involving some of the main uh, Spanish NGOs on board in the process and the fact that some of them accepted to do that, um, that it, it helped uh, the process. And for the second one, so the expectations of the members, Susie was pointing at the fact that 
um, it could help to have uh, to to give a better sense of to members of the reality of politics to help them measure where their proposals are going to land and for them to grasp also a bit the complexity and and maybe also have a, a, a better sense that they they ha have not been given a, a, a direct power to change the law somehow, uh, something that many members of the French Climate Assembly thought they had and they were entitled to have uh, during the process. But uh, someone was also pointing at the fact that we need to keep a balance and not to, to kill the mood and to kill the motivation because we also want participants to stay involved in the process and, and the, the fact that they feel some agency, they feel empowered, uh, uh, really helps and get them committed in the, in, in the process. Um, so basically that's where we were at and sorry, I'm checking my notes. Yeah, it's, it's, Basically been that and also, sorry, we also had a contribution, I think, interesting that when you also have a process that is very closed, where you have no communication about what's happening or the commissioner doesn't want to create a, a place where everybody can get information and know what's happening in the process. Uh, there are no expectations towards the process from anyone because you, you don't know what's going to come out of it. Uh, and it can also generate some frustration from the participants um, here. I'm, I'm, uh, we, we should be looking, and I think Knoke is going to organize sometime by the end of the year, a learning call on the Luxembourg Climate Assembly. And I think it's really interesting that we learn from uh, practice that seems to be quite different from the others. So that was it. Maybe Magali, Alina, or Susie, or Heda, do you want to, to add anything? Okay, so another bit of golden silence. I saw some hands, so some thumbs go up. So I think you covered it very well, Eve. I think in general, this has been a really rich and interesting uh, debate. We have nine or so minutes left, which is in a way a long time. You could, uh, we can still find some wisdom, I think, in those minutes. But I want to end up by giving uh, the word to Graham, the chair of Knocker, when we get very close to the end. But before we do so, I want to just uh, have a look around, particularly at our panelists, but also you, Jane. And actually, anyone else who has some wisdom to impart. Um, Kanaka really, it's all about trying to find out how to support uh, the creation of high quality climate assemblies. So for this uh, whole question around governance, of course, what we're looking for is uh, good advice to pass forward to the ones who are right now faced with setting up the governance structures. And if you have any wisdom to impart now towards the end, this would be a great time to hear it. Before uh, I give the floor to the, to you one by one, I want to just ask Deborah. You had a great point that you should always leave one room open. Um, so I just want to give you the chance to say what would you have talked about if we had had a, a room without a headline. And sorry for putting you on the spot now by asking you, but I'm very curious. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that's very kind of you. Um, I think I'd like to have talked about a couple of things. One of them I touched upon in our particular breakout room, which is how we can expand the legitimacy, not just of governance, but of the decision-making process by um, expanding our ideas on collective intelligence. At the moment, we're utilizing deliberative democracy, uh, deliberation that engages cognition. It's one part of the brain. But um, that leads to, for example, uh, minority viewpoints. You'll never get consensus. And that leaves some participants frustrated and, and they would not say that the outcome is fully legitimate. But if you include another type of collective intelligence, which is the aggregative collective intelligence, which is whereby individuals vote on particular topics and their and and it's made in such a way as to be numerical in basis they, they give a, a numerical value to something whether it's a budget for to be allocated to a particular method of combating climate change or what have you um, if they can if we can utilize aggregative intelligence in that way uh, then everybody will have the feeling that their vote counts that their voice has been heard because um, the result is purely aggregative yeah so in summary, 
to expand deliberation with uh, aggregative collective intelligence. And uh, one other thing that I would also like to have discussed today, and obviously we don't have enough time now, but maybe we can have a future workshop because climate change is a global issue. I'd like us to look to the future of climate governance in terms of global citizens assemblies. There's already been one which I was intensely involved with, had a lot of problems, especially ethical problems of governance, uh, as some of you will already know. Uh, yeah, a lot of work to be done there. I would, I would love to talk about that with you at some future point. Yeah, that's me. Thanks. <laughs> That's great input, uh, Deborah. And actually, this is a good chance and opportunity to say to everyone listening that if you do have good ideas for future workshops, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. So I'm going to do a marketing uh, move here and say you can reach us on info.knocke.eu. <laughs> we would actually really like to hear any and all good uh, ideas for future workshops. But having said that now, we're going into the very last few minutes. So do any of our panelists or do you, Jane, have some final thoughts? Uh, on what we've been talking about today. Yeah, I can just jump in before the panelists. Um, thanks, thanks, Mark. Um, I I was really struck um, during the during the whole event, really, with and and especially in the breakout rooms, with how governance obviously just affects everything else, um, and. Um, we got a little bit distracted uh, again as well, Graham. In in our breakout room, we're talking about um, uh, how um, uh, about the uh, scope in a climate assembly and how governance affects that. And and um, I, I do want to take this opportunity in the spirit of giving good advice to direct people to the Kanaka website where we do have some really good briefings on um, impact and um, framing of climate change um, and other aspects of, of, um, of uh, putting together a climate assembly. So I'll, I'll do that little bit of marketing as well. Um, the other thing that I did, what, which kind of surprised me about what came out of um, this discussion was the um, the value of having um, a chair or a, or a, or a or another uh, or a figurehead of some sort um, and how that could perhaps give um, uh, have an impact on um, publicity raising publicity and also um, monitoring and reporting on um, the response um, to the to, to recommendations as well and I think that's something that hadn't really um, included in the review as strongly, and perhaps I'm I'm going to reflect on that um, as well. That value of having a chair. But what I would say is, from the um, from the interviews I had, um, is that it is important to um, uh, engage that sort of person quite early on in the process. And I, I, sorry, I don't want to take up too much time, so I'll hand on to any of the other panel members. Thanks, Jane, and I'll ask you as a challenge the rest of you like a 30 second summary of the most important things to say now. Whoever's first, go for it. I'll go first if you like. Um, just briefly, I think um, the process of um, citizens assembly as part of uh, representative democracy is still being established in the UK, certainly, and I think more broadly. So it's vital that um, we don't collectively do anything to 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 damage the um, the concept, and there are many ways of doing governance. I think only we obsess about it. The press, politicians, by and large, don't care. Many ways of doing it. It's not going to be the focus. But having said that, you don't get any credit for doing it well. But it is possible to get discredit for doing it badly. In one particular case. Uh, if uh, an assembly was seen to have a very bad process with a biased outcome, that could really do damage to the concept as a whole, and that's what we should be trying to avoid. Thank you. Great point, Chris. Yes, Annika, I see you unmuted yourself, or did you? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have any further things. No? Okay. Um, well, Lise or Chris, no, Chris, sorry, you've spoken, of course. Susie, if you have any final wisdom, now's the chance. 
I'm not sure I have any great wisdom, but to um, agree with everything that Chris said, and also perhaps to say um, the importance of retaining flexibility and not um, following too rigid a single model, but um, adapting to the, the situation of the, of the particular um, country or, or area. Okay, good. Uh, Lise, you get the second to last uh, word before Graham. Um, someone was making a reference uh, to OECD standards in the chats. And I think that um, they are indeed useful. They are setting up some principles, but they remain general principles. And most of the time, I feel it's very important that we make sure civil society organizations and as many as possible try to contribute ahead to the governance in saying what their red lines can be or what they feel is important, not only in terms of designing the how the process should be run, but also what the process should focus on, because it's the other question that uh, will uh, impact or will, will make the process relevant or not, is trying to get better remits to, to, to have processes that focus on something a bit more focused or narrow than just the climate crisis. So my to potential, my advice would be we need more civil society organizations to get interested and not just all a uh, very nice crowd of uh, climate assembly geeks that, uh, of course, we love to, to share moments together, but it's about having others develop their own thinking about the processes. Okay, thank you. Now, Graham, you get the challenge of summarizing what we've talked about while also doing a bit of more marketing for what happens in Knocker perhaps in the coming time. But from my side, I'll just say thank you, everyone. It's been a great pleasure. Graham. Okay, well, I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank Mark and Stina and um, Nana for taking us through this, this process. It's been, it's been really, really helpful. My thoughts are a, a few quick thoughts. One is that we expect a lot from the governance processes. We expect them to enable there to be some sort of uh, degree of legitimacy, ensuring legitimacy of the process, however we understand that. We also expect it to have the, cap the capacity to de help design the process, to oversee the design of the process. And we also hope that it will be um, a mechanism through which we will have impact on the commissioner and other stakeholders. And trying to do those three things at the same time, I think something that Chris was saying, there is no perfect design here. It's always going to be a compromise. And what I heard from the, um, what I heard from the, 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 the speakers was how actually there was no kind of conscious choice of governance model. Often it kind of, it, it, it appeared because of the kind of political contacts and the way of doing things in their area. And also just because that was the way they thought about it at that moment, you know, that was a very, a very contingent. Um, and also from drawing from previous experience. So I thought it was very interesting that um, Susie mentioned that they learned from UK and from Ireland and to, to, to develop theirs. What I think what's interesting about the next wave of assemblies and that was something Lise was pointing towards, is that they have a capacity to be much more conscious about their choices that they're making, having that capacity to learn from what's gone on before. Whether that's an advantage or disadvantage, I don't, I don't, I don't, necessarily, I don't necessarily know, but it is very interesting that, again, as Lise pointed out, they've tended to do very similar kinds of things to what we've seen already. Um, and there is, that again, that tendency of path dependency that we just do what other people have done. And the last thing I just want to leave us with is a thought about this issue about formal rules and procedures, because I think it was only in Germany where they kind of really formalized um, who, who had responsibility for what. And a lot of this has worked because people have been flexible and people have had a collaborative ethos, perhaps not so much in France, um, but in, in most other places there has been amongst the governance actors a real desire to do the right thing. And I guess the question is, what happens when you have governance people involved in the governance who aren't so interested in doing the right thing or, or start you start to have conflict and whether or not we do need to formalize, you know, whether it is an advantage to formalize rules or whether flexibility is an advantage. And I'm not really sure what the answer to that is, um, but I think it's a really interesting, interesting thing for us to take forward. So um, once again, as Mark said, I'm really thank you very much for bringing your collective wisdom to bear on this topic. I hope we're going to produce I mean, we've got the excellent um, briefing that Jane produced. So thank you very much for that, Jane. Um, uh, but I also think it might be quite useful for us to try and produce a one-pager, a two-pager, which gives a kind of 
you know, some of the key things that we need to be thinking about in relation to governance, the kind of things that we've been talking about today. So once again, um, I really appreciate your engagement with Knocker.